Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today, we are going to take a fully spoilery look at Kaiju Number Eight, Chapter Sixty Six, and woo wow! Let's start off with a brief nod to the elephant in the chapter. Without spoilers just yet, there was a doozy of a twist at the end of this chapter. Note, I say a twist because it's not just a plot twist because this might very well be a genre twist taking this to a far this so far very scientific series off in another direction altogether but all that in due time there's just so much in this chapter that i can't wait to get started first we are expecting a training arc chapter either kafka hoshina ex-military dude psychon boy or reno fourth fourth division captain and we did get the beginning of a training arc and in addition to the general to the lady of fans getting what they expected, what they wanted, I got something a little special just for me. But that is all for the spoiler for, spoiler section. You get a tr training arc with a plot twist at the end, such a complex concept, or rather, I should say, such a simple concept, yet so flawlessly executed. But now, I will give you a chance to click away by checking out the links below the video to get yourself a copy of Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, Monty Python Meets Star Trek, and my short story collection of human absurdity. Now, the spoilers. Mm, the art. Matsumoto's art is so very much a part of the story, and the art is telling the story that I personally have been longing for in this chapter. I think I made an entire video just describing how Matsumoto drew Vice Captain Hoshina leaning back in his chair after a long day of studying Kaiju number 8 and Kaiju number 9. In one panel, Matsumoto captured the movements of sitting up, putting your arms behind your head, arching your back like you do when you've been studying over a computer for too long, and then dropping your arms down. That was a whole series of animations, all packed into one panel, because of how awesome Matsumoto was at drawing art. Then we saw the way that Matsumoto drew Kaiju number 8 facing down and defeating the Yoju Bomb. I remember saying that I didn't think the animation could make that scene any better because of how well it was drawn. It was so fluid, you could see every motion, follow every beat. And then we get to this training, or rather pre-training arc fight. Suddenly, our fluid cat-like Vice Captain Hoshina is stiff. Well, not exactly stiff, but solid. Instead of using his smaller size and flowing motion against Kafka, Vice Captain Hoshina is centered like a rock, just barely dodging the blows by millimeters and then powering into Kafka like a pile driver. Compare how Vice Captain Hoshina is fighting Kafka here to how Vice Captain Hoshina moved when using his swords on number eight. It's very, very different, and it makes me the happiest little fangirl on the planet. See, from way back, and I do mean way back, as in from when we first introduced, were first introduced to Vice Captain Hoshina's specialty fighting style, I think we all had the hope that Vice Captain Hoshina was going to train Kafka as Kaiju number eight. The Vice Captain was uniquely qualified to do so. He had the speed, the strength, the stamina, and most importantly, the specialization in fighting small to mid-sized kaiju. For manga's sake, he was even Kafka's stated and declared rival. The laws of shonen practically demand that he train him. Given that this was a shonen battle manga, it was all but a given that he would be training Kafka to use kaiju, the kaiju number eight body one day. However, and this was a big old honkin' however for me, when we actually saw them fight in chapters 19, Vice Cap a huge issue got raised. Vice Captain Hoshina is a swordsman. Kafka is, even in, no, especially in his kaiju form, a brawler, something that Vice Captain Hoshina comments on in chapter 66. Kafka's first instinct when faced with a threat is to punch it. We see this way back when Reno confronts him in chapter 1, and for very, very obvious reasons, an instinct-punching brawler doesn't train well with a swordmaster. I mean, can you imagine how many limbs Kafka would lose in a 1v1 with Hoshina's blades? Then our belovedly terrifying director general snatches Kafka away from Vice Captain Hoshina immediately after chapter 32, and we got introduced to weapon number two, and I got all kinds of excited. It was shown from the first when, instead of walking in with number two powered up and crushing Kafka in his human form, the director general loudly and pointedly announced that he was going to take his kaiju punching gloves and punch the kaiju to death 
It was perfectly clear that he was testing Kafka, not actually trying to one-off him. And then we got to see the two of them fight, and it was glorious! But most importantly for the point of this video, they were very well matched. They were both ultimately brawlers, no matter how refined and scientific the Director General's combat style was. They both gave damage and took blows, and as long as the Director General was among the living, I retained a hope that Isil himself was going to take Kafka's training in hand. Ultimately, an experienced brawler would be a much better trainer for an instinctive brawler like Kafka. And here, Matsumoto has given me both things that I wanted at once. Vice Captain Hoshino will be training Kafka to use the Kaiju number no. 8 powers to the best of his ability, using the vital te fighting technique not of a sword man, but of a brawler. Techniques developed by the Director General Aiso Shinomaya himself. Ah, so perfect. As if the Director General was stepping up out of the grave to train Kafka. And this could lead in some, into some delightfully heartbreaking moments. Just think of this from a storytelling perspective. There is going to come a time with Ka when Kikoru will see her friend using that fighting style. What delicious heartbreak will that cause her? So, the vice captain drags Kafka out to a historic shine. Back to this chapter. Back to the chapter review. Vice Captain drags Kafka out to, to a the historic shrine where all of the Vice Captain's kaiju fighting ancestors are interned. There, the Vice Captain shares a bit of his family history and beats Kafka into confidence so they can start training. After a good night's sleep, that is. They have to go back to the base before all the, all the lights are out after all. So, what do you think, my wonderful viewers? What? Why are you cranky? Oh, right. I almost forgot the elephant in the room for a moment because... That one paragraph could really, really summarize the entire chapter. The vice captain drags Kafka out for, out for a pre-training arc battle. But afterwards, we have two little panels that completely uproot and change the flow of the story, possibly even changing the very genre. You see, what did Kafka see after he paid his respects to, the, to his fallen ancestors? The twist, the image, the vision, what was it? All we know is that we got our usual number of pages. This is, that is, we get past page 22 and 23 and land on page 24 and 25. The vice captain has wrapped up his speech and Kafka has a few panels for reflection on his new confidence and his new goals. Page 25 ends with a powerful image of Kafka walking away from the shrine determined to get more powerful. The predictable shonen ending to an excellent shonen chapter. A chapter that was about history. A chapter that was about grounded fight scenes and realistic expectations. There is even a nice little detail that grounds you in the real world from panel 1. Vice Captain Hoshina backs the deuce and a half looking military truck perfectly into the parking spot. No mean feat and a standard military safety regulation. Back in, pull out. Just a nice little touch to remind you that for all that this chapter is set in a shrine, this is a science fiction manga that is fully grounded in a world as pragmatic and material as our own, where you don't want to be backing up a ton, a two and a half ton truck because you might run over something. So, at the end of page 25, the hard-working, pragmatic military officer in this commonplace, materialistic world walks away from the shrine. But, being a polite and traditional kind of guy, on page 26, he takes a moment to bow to the shrine and show his respect to his fallen brothers interred there. And then he sees the samurai ghost. Yep, this is a manga, that is a shrine, that was clearly a ghost. Then the ghost is gone in a burst of brain static, and our hero rubs his eyes in confusion, blinks, and runs after his scolding senpai. Classic supernatural manga stuff. So, what the ever-loving manga in th is the supernatural madness doing in my sci-fi story? To be fair, sci-fi has a long tradition of incorporating the supernatural, but that is a twist. So, let's look at the possibilities. Matsumoto is not going to waste two full pages on a random moment of a fatigued Kafka seeing something imaginary. So, clearly he did see something. So, my three theories are this in no particular order, and I go into these in much further detail in a previous video. First theory. This was a memory of little guys. Perhaps a samurai warrior he bonded with centuries before, and the one who, who helps defeat or defeated the Daikaiju of 1657. This would suggest that little guy 
himself is much, much older than we thought. Or it could be sort of an ancestor of little guys, a, the kaiju that formed a human-kaiju hybrid that spawned him. But anyway, this is, would be something in the shrine triggered a memory in little guy, either a genetic memory or a personal memory. Theory number two. This was a kaiju hybrid like Kafka, who is currently slumbering in the vaults with Hoshina's ancestors, and the presence of kaiju number eight woke him or it. That would be very interesting, because then we'd have two kaiju number eight-like superpowers running around. Or, number three, which is completely different, and I owe this one partly to a Redditor's comment, perhaps, because this did look like Kafka sensing another another kaiju, this was a new kaiju, a more stealth-based kaiju sent by kaiju number nine, and little guy's presence allowed Kafka to see through its isolation field. Because, remember, kaiju number nine had those very powerful but static isolation fields that kaiju number eight could sense through. But, if we see that kaiju number nine is constantly interacting and changing, it's entirely possible that kaiju number nine tweaked his isolation field in an attempt to make it completely invisible, even to kaiju number eight, and sent out a body with that capacity. Why it would look like a samurai, I don't know, but if this was a mental fog deliberately designed to affect kaiju number eight, it could be that ka the kaiju number eight Kafka joining allows them to see through it, but not entirely. And that the samurai image was Kafka's brain trying to translate whatever information was coming through the isolation field. All right, so those are my main three theories. This was a little guy's ancestor, uh, an ancestor memory of little guys. This was another human, Kaf human kaiju hybrid like Kafka, or this was a kai a kaiju sent by kaiju number nine with a more stealth mode that Kafka was seeing through. But of course, I suppose it could still be a ghost of some sort. Of course, these three theories will be getting got their own video, but we will probably have to wait chapters and chapters of training arc meet to get to any sort of answer about it. So what do you think, my wonderful viewers? Leave a like and a comment below. Tell me what you think that ghost is, because I do want to hear. And peace out, my wonderful viewers. Humans are weird. We took a vote. And humans are weird. I have the data. Two books in a series of human absurdity. Go check out these short story collections. What will our little green friends think of us when we finally do make it to space? Find out the answer in two books of human absurdity. Humans are weird, we took a vote, and humans are weird, I have the data. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo and & Google Play.